but theme-based. So today is all about what it means to study the business programs at our college. Um, that School of Business is made up of four different majors, accounting, finance, marketing, and management. If you're not sure which one you want to do yet, or if you're not even positive on business just yet, I hope today's session gives you a really good overview of overall academic experience at Providence, that academic excellence we are so proud of, um, but then dive deeply into what it actually means to study one of those four business programs. Um, just as a quick little intro and kind of rundown of what today's schedule looks like, you're only with us for about an hour and a half. Um, if you need to pop off any earlier, I understand this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to view that later. Um, but Dr. Dana Dillon is here, uh, she'll get us started shortly um, to really just go through what our liberal arts identity really looks like, specifically touching upon our coveted in, uh, development of Western civilization program, that real unique piece about who Providence College is as an institution. You're going to hear from Jackie Elsack, she is a member of the School of Business. Uh, and then Dr. Jennifer Van Reet to talk about the Center for Engaged Learning, and then hear from a number of our current students giving you that real life PC perspective. Uh, I know you don't necessarily wanna hear me talk about the common application for too long, uh, but just as a general overview of our admission process, uh, fully underway now, um, we are a common application school, uh, so that is the only application that we do accept. We do really encourage you to uh, attend our different information sessions throughout this fall um, and really connect with your personal admission counselor within our office. As I said, there's 17 of us, so every single one of you is tied to an individual counselor in our office. And we're more than happy to answer any of your questions about the actual admission review process moving forward. Um, but this is a great way to understand why Providence and what makes us special. Big things about our campus, itself. We are a smaller size school. We have 4,100 undergraduate students. Average class size on campus is 20 students. You'll hear Dr. Dillon talk about that personalized connection that really we do pride ourselves in. We are a Catholic institution, not just Catholic, Catholic and Dominican, being the only school in the country by the Dominican friars. Uh, you are about to hear all about our liberal arts education. And we have a really great location because our students do get that best of both worlds experience of being a city school, but then still having that campus environment to take full advantage of our 100 plus clubs that are available to students. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Dillon, I'll have you come on and really give us that insight on what it means to be a liberal arts school, specifically touching upon development of Western civilization. And to all of the students attending right now, feel free to use the Q&A feature on Zoom here. Um, we will pause for questions throughout the entire presentation, um, and I promise we'll get to all of them at some point during our afternoon together today, uh, but feel free to add any questions there. Dr. Dillon? All right, and do you want, uh, uh, do you want to have me start my video? If, if you'd like to. I'm happy to do that. I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not letting me yet, so. Let but me as see on my end. Of course, they'll see my you know picture from I think that's eight years ago. And uh, <laughs> but as as we why get don't you started get started with, while I figure this out? Absolutely. So hi everybody. My name is Dana Dillon. I'm a theologian by training, so I teach in the theology department here at PC. I actually have a joint appointment, so I also teach in a program called Public and Com Community Service Studies. Yes, that's an academic uh, department, and you can major in that at PC. But I'm also right now serving as the associate director. Hi, there I am. I'm the associate director of the development of Western Civilization Program. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the liberal arts core and specifically that development of Western Civilization uh, Program. One of the things, so I was a theology major when I was an undergrad and people asked, uh, well, what are you going to do with that? And I didn't know yet that the right answer was, I'll be a theology professor, so of course I'm going to be able to use that. But um, at, at my college, uh, the theology majors and philosophy majors had a, had a saying uh, that we're going to do anything that requires us to read, write, or think. And I think that that's a, that's a good way of talking about what, what the, the liberal arts are so important for, right? This is not just, uh, this is, you know, philosophy, literature, history, uh, theology, and other arts and sciences, right? The, uh, the, the social sciences and the, and the natural sciences as well. All of those things are 
disciplines that help us to 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 think better, to read better, to uh, to write better, to make arguments better. And so I, I will say that the dean of the business school, Dean Maxfield, likes to say that um, coming to PC, it's like minoring in the liberal arts, and that she gets a lot of good feedback about how well prepared and well rounded. PC business majors are because of the liberal arts core. Um, and so let me say a little bit more about this. So one of the things that I love about teaching in the DWC program, every DWC uh, team has, has three professors and you're paired with a group of about 96 students. If you divide 96 by six, we have 16. So each professor has 16, two groups of 16 students that are in their seminar. So if you can picture this, twice a week, you meet with, um, with the entire CIV team, uh, all 96 students and all three professors. And so if you're thinking about college as what I really want for my college experience is to be in a big lecture where a professor has a carefully prepared lecture and helps me see how to see things, this is that class. Two hours a week, that's, that's how, you, how you meet. But also two hours a week, you spend in seminar where it's just you and those other 15 students together with the professor. And what we do is we engage some of the greatest questions in the history of Western civilization and some of the greatest texts. And so the first semester moves you through the beginning of time to about the year 800 with the reign of Charlemagne. The second semester takes you from that point to just shy of the American and French revolutions. And the third, semester takes you from the French and American revolutions to the, the present day. And in every one of those three semesters, you're engaging texts from literature, history, philosophy, and um, theology. I almost forgot one. It's my, my own field, uh, theology. And you're engaging questions like, what does it mean to be human? Is there a God? How do faith and reason work together? What does a just society look like? What does a good, li a good life look like? Uh, these great questions that these texts throughout the out the ages have answered uh, or have tried to answer. And what I'm, I'm teaching sophomores right now, so we're in the third semester, and it's really interesting and beautiful to see them begin to go from hearing other thinkers uh, answers to those questions to beginning to really express their own answers to those to those questions as well. As, as Elizabeth said, we are a Catholic and Dominican school, so we have the opportunity not just to engage the great secular texts throughout the ages, but also to engage the great theological and faith-based texts as well, and to really engage those questions of um, faith and reason and what uh, human life is for in its transcendent state as well. Although, again, we, we, I think every professor is a little bit different but we do not assume that uh, everybody in the room is Catholic. We certainly don't assume that everybody in the room uh, is familiar with the Dominican tradition, uh, but we do engage uh, the text. And by the way, not every, not every professor is Catholic, but we do engage those questions, um, th those traditions in ways that invite you also to engage them and, and think through these texts with them. Um, Liz, are, are there other key things you want to make sure that I cover here or are there Do you want to talk about your colloquium? Oh, sure. I, I thank you for that. I, I knew I was forgetting something. So that, that fourth semester, that fourth semester is a colloquium. And those are basically any topic that can engage the Western uh, civilization tradition. And of course, also beyond that tradition as well. Uh, a lot of times in both the third and the fourth semester, we we talk about the West engaging the rest of the world or some things like that. Um, but those can be anything that anybody can dream up. I have been teaching for about seven years with a colleague in the history department, Dr. Jennifer Aluzzi, uh, a class called Racism and Theologies of Liberation. And in that class, we really dive into, I mean, we, we lead with the question of, is the West and is Christianity and is America like by its very nation, by, by its very nature, are, are those entities um, imperialist? Are they white supremacist? Are they patriarchal? Um, and, uh, and, and we, we engage that question by reading all kinds of texts from a lot of uh, people of color, 
a lot of African American theologians, in fact, as well as a lot of other voices. Um, and it's been a really important class for me to get to engage with students on that. And in fact, teaching that for the last seven years has transformed my approach to the rest of the semesters as well. Um, and one, again, one of the great gifts of this program is I get to work with colleagues. I'm, I constantly get to be a learner as well as a teacher, both in conversation with my students and because this is a truly interdisciplinary class where we as professors get to engage one another uh, in these questions as well. And I think it's part of what keeps our community a vibrant intellectual community, but also, and I really wanna invite you to think about this. Um, so because of DWC, if you come to PC for the first four semesters, every single one of those semesters, you will spend two hours of your life in a seminar with about 14 to 17 other students and that one professor. That professor will know your name, you will know that professor's name, you will ask that professor, I'm actually working after this call on a letter of recommendation for uh, a student of mine who wants to uh, uh, apply for a Fulbright, so, um, and, and I know her well enough, I've taught her in two classes to, to, to write that recommendation and, and do well by, by her in that. But I think that our students become, through that process, I mean, that's part of how we become an intellectual community and a connected community to one another. We know each other and we're, we're kind of in each other's lives. It's a little strange in the time of COVID to have some more distance sometimes with that. But even with that, I had, I had three, I mean, all by Zoom, but I had three meetings today with students from my DWC class who are working on papers for seminar for Thursday. Um, and so we're still we're still connecting and we're still um, taking care of one another in, in those ways. Perfect. Um, in the last two minutes here, um, students, if there's any questions for Dr. Dillon about that development of Western Civilization program, um, feel free to add that in the Q&A feature. Um, I am a PC alum. I wish I had taken my colloquium with you. Uh, Loved my experience, and it's definitely a class that made me a better student throughout the other two years. Um, and it's always so interesting to me because the course brings together students from every discipline. So you're meeting students that you may not have met otherwise during your academic career. Sure, you may meet them in your residence hall, in the dining hall, through activities and things like that. But to be able to really engage with students um, in that one academic setting, I thought was really cool to hear the perspective as a psychology student, somebody with an accounting background, how they read a text and see what they have to say. Um, there is one question about, uh, is this the only class you're taking your freshman and sophomore year? Um, of course, the answer is no, but Dr. Dillon, I'll let you follow up a little bit more. So what, what, what happens is that, so we usually encourage students to, to take the DWC course plus three other courses, sometimes four, depending on, on one's major. And you know, if, if there's a lot of labs or something like that, you might, you might do fewer. Um, but so you'll be, you'll be in that course. And, and by the way, it changes, right? There's gonna be one team that teaches that your first semester freshman year maybe sometimes some overlap with the second semester uh, freshman year, and then a completely different team for your third semester, a completely different team. So even though it is a program and it's unified in a sense, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a new course every semester in that way. And uh, just to add to something that, that Elizabeth said, um, not only in DWC, but also other core classes. In fact, I'll just share that I'm teaching a first year experience class for, for freshmen. And I have some older mentor students. And we had a, a session on the core last week. And one of the things that, that the seniors and juniors who are who are mentors said with deep appreciation was that not only in DWC, but in especially theology and philosophy, uh, they were they really valued that ability to come in as an HPM major and see what, you know, connect with the way people from science majors or business majors. Um, engage those same issues and it helps them to cross pollinate and, and connect. Um, so I think our students really value it. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and with that being said, uh, let's bring on our next presenter. Thank you so much, Dr. Dillon, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Good luck, you everybody. See her at other presentations and things. She is a DWC guru for us in the office. So thank you so much. Um, Thanks, everybody. Go Friars. <laughs> Jackie, I will have you come on as a panelist now. There we go. Give me one moment to now make you a co-host so that you can do all of the things. Wonderful. Um, so Dr. Dillon explained what it means from that liberal arts perspective. Um, Jackie's here to share what that means from a business student perspective. Um, so Dr. Or Jackie, feel free to take it away. Sure. Thank you so much uh, for letting me join with you today. So thank you all for getting on this call. Um, I do have a set of slides, so I think Liz is going to share those slides with you. And so I'm here to represent the School of Business. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Elsick, but most people call me Jackie. I work as Associate Dean in the School of Business. I've been here going on my eighth year at Providence College, and I, I very much feel a part of the Friar family. So I'm very excited to be here with you today. So one of the things you're going to see, you know, when you visit campus, or you get on our website is that you know, we have a tagline and, you know, and I mean that affectionately because what we believe we are doing is we're educating for a future based on we. And, and, and why we got to this tagline is that everything we do in the business school is to prepare you to be working in teams, engaging with other students, engaging with employers, engaging with colleagues. So everything we're focused on is about this concept of we. And so our curriculum, your team projects, and for the students who want to get more involved in student engagement, competitions, certifications, all the things that I'm going to talk to you about to make you a well-rounded holistic business student is really focused about educating you for the future. And so having said that, I'm going to go to the next slide. And what I'm going to do is kick off with, you know, a high level what our curriculum is. Because a lot of times students aren't always as familiar, you know, as I thought they might be of what is a curriculum? What does it mean to be a business major at Providence College? What are some of the courses I might take? So I'll do that first, and then I'll launch into the student engagement experiential learning. And what I mean by that are the things outside the classroom or parallel to your classroom experience that really help you differentiate as well as apply what you're learning in the classroom. Really the things that employers are looking for to make sure you're really connecting and engaging with the content and you know how to apply what you learn to like a real world, real work situation. So this is a pyramid that we like to use a lot. Um, and so <laughs> we bring this out for like every opportunity we can uh, because we think this showcases, you know, what our curriculum looks like. So our curriculum is designed to sit on a foundation of what we call the PC core. So the province core curriculum. Every student on campus is going to take this PC core and I'm going to show you some highlights in a second. So that's the foundation. We think that's the strength of our business school degree is that we are educating you adding what we call the quote unquote technical business competencies on top of a very strong liberal arts degree. So we think this is a win-win. We think that our students are gonna come out and they're gonna be very successful. And to be candid, since I sit in a lot of the meetings, as does the Dean of our Business Advisory Council, we have focus groups with companies. We know our students are well prepared for the business world because of this combination of both business and liberal arts. Like it's a perfect combo. It's, you're coming out with these skills where you can engage with other learners, you can write well, you can communicate effectively, but then you also have these strong skills in analytics. You have the strong skills in finance, math, marketing, all the things you really need, the kind of breadth of business you need, plus all that liberal arts that really makes you a really well-prepared job seeker. And as I said, I mean, you're going to have what we see as business core classes. So regardless of your major, every student in the business school is going to take courses in accounting, finance, math, math, marketing, math, management, uh, statistics, operations. You're going to take courses in all these areas to help you be a well-rounded business student. And then every student's going to select a major. And then when you select your major, you're going to take another five to eight courses in that major. And you'll have a professional slash faculty advisor to help guide you on your course selection because your course selections around the elective pieces of that should really center on what your interests are in the workplace. And so no worries, 
it's a little early to talk about that, but we always get there to help you out, so don't worry. And then much like every school in the country, you need 120 credit hours to graduate, you have to have a 2.0 GPA, and we actually have a requirement in the business school that you have to have a 2.5 at the end of your first year to continue as a major. We do this to set you up for success. You know, we very much want you to be a competitive job seeker. You really need to have a pretty good GPA to be a competitive job seeker. We're going to talk to you like first thing about the most competitive jobs that need well above a 2.5. But don't worry, you're going to hear from me how we're going to set you up to be prepared for all of that. So then I'm going to go to the next slide, which is really kind of a quick intro to what is this PC core curriculum. So like I said, this is the foundation. These are the courses every PC student takes regardless of major. And I know you just heard about Western Civ, so I won't spend a ton of time about Western Civ, because I think you know at this point you're all taking Western Civ. It's one of the things everybody on campus has in common. Uh, from there, you're going to take theology courses, you're going to take philosophy courses, you're going to take a natural science. If you're in the business school, your social science requirement will be fulfilled by either micro or macroeconomics. There's a quantitative reasoning requirement that's going to get fulfilled with either a basic math class or business calculus or calculus. Every student takes a fine arts course. And then we have these proficiencies. And you heard me talk a little bit about this. So this is where you're going to take either, you're going to take both a writing one, writing two, oral, diversity, civic engagement, some of these can come from your curriculum. So some of these courses you may see in your accounting major or finance major. You can see all of you are gonna meet the diversity requirement because Magic 301 is actually a requirement for all of our business majors. And that's actually like our organizational behavior teams class. Um, although all classes have a teams component to it, that's the class where you really learn a lot about what does it mean to be in a team? What does that mean for the workplace? Like how does that impact organizational culture? And so I'm gonna move to the next slide, which is really gonna showcase you know, what does it mean to be a business major? What are the core classes that we all take? So okay, these are, I'm gonna jump in real fast, so sorry. Um, but I do think you do an amazing job of explaining to students that it's not two separate core curriculum and major requirements you have to complete for your four years. So thank you so much for explaining it that way of your major classes will also count towards that. So um, sometimes students see it as two separate things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but we have like a first, we have a first year advising requirement uh, for our students where we go a lot more in depth with all of this. This is actually like a kind of high level of some of the slides we would normally share at an orientation. Actually, the last few weeks as we just started school, and we're in week four, we've been sharing a lot of these slides, talking to our students, doing advising meetings, etc. And so this is the core curriculum. So every business major takes these courses. So you can see the breadth right, that you're going to come out as a well-rounded business student and that you're going to take financial and magical accounting. And typically our students take that first year. So from the very beginning, you get a taste of business your first year of college. Many of our students are going to take data application for business. Think of this as Excel and databases. So I talked about that analytics piece. This is where that starts. And I'm sure many of you heard this term big data. That's what I mean by the analytics, like all the information about people um, and processes that we use day to day to make decisions. Um, and then we've got the microeconomics and macroeconomics. Again, so important to starting that understanding of the economy and then building on that for your finance classes. You'll then take managerial finance. Later around your junior year, you're gonna take operations management, your organizational behavior class, depending on your major, that could be sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Every student takes a legal environments course. You're also gonna take a principles and marketing course and then math and statistics. So this is really what your curriculum is. And I don't have a slide about each major because what happens is each major just builds on this. But I wanted to make sure that everyone understands what one of the, I think most positive aspects of being at Providence College is that your first year is going to be a blend of courses between the PC core and the PCSB core, or what we call Providence College School of Business core. And I think that's so important because that means at the end of the first year, if you decide to change majors in the business school, it's very easy. You decide you want to change majors across campus, it's very easy. Those are very easy things to do. You don't apply to change majors. 
Now in the School of Business, we do ask students to attend information sessions and a couple other pieces, but, but you're welcome to come to the business school. Everyone's invited to the business school. But we do ask because of some of the nuanced differences of things we do around student engagement and curriculum, we do ask students to attend info sessions and we do ask all of our students to be part of what we call these first year advising workshops. And again, they're to set you up for success so that by the time you're through four years, you're familiar with the resources on campus, you're familiar with the different student engagement or experiential learning activities you could do because we really want to make sure you create the experience you want at Providence College. There's really the world is open to you and your experience is open to you. You just have to kind of ask for it. But just in case, we let you know about a lot of opportunities up front so you can make those decisions for yourself. Liz, anything to add? Great. So now I'm going to shift out of the curriculum and move over to the first year experience, which is going to blend just into the PCSB experience in general. And so the next slide kicks us off with one of our new student engagement programs, the Fire Leadership and Immersion Program. And so when you see the FLIP program on this kind of next slide, um, you'll see that it really is geared to three main aspects of it. One is the student engagement piece career exploration, and then throughout this program, students have the opportunity at competencies and badges. And you probably heard a little bit about this. It's a really big um, movement in higher education, especially among business school, this, schools, this idea of like competencies and badges. And these are ways to showcase what you've achieved. And so we have competencies and badges around leadership, cultural agility, uh, professional development, technology. Like we have multiple campuses and badges that you can share with employers because employers are looking for those students who are engaged on campus. You know, one of the things all college students have in common is that you're taking classes and that you're going to get a degree. What differentiates you? These type of student engagement activities differentiate you. And part of FLIP is also career exploration because we know you're coming in and you have questions like, what do I do with these majors? What are the industries within certain areas? You know, people talk about getting a job on Wall Street. What does that mean? If I said wealth management, what does that mean? Where do I work? What do I do every day? So the career exploration piece is built into our first year experience, but it continues with you all four years as you go into higher level activities. So your first year, you might be more in what we call exposure activities, like coming and listening, maybe doing some networking, kind of trying to figure things out, like listen to speakers from other co from companies, alumni that come in. And then from there, you're going to get into more complex, like internships. What we Sometimes we call them case competitions as well. You might start doing certifications because you know there's an area or industry you want to go into. All of those are part of FLIP and they get more complex. So you go from exposure to what we call mastery. And that's all part of this FLIP program. And sometimes I make jokes and I'm like, you're going to flip out over it. And a few of the students give me like what I call pity laughs, right? And I think to myself, they're my favorites. No, I'm kidding. No favorites. <laughs> Everyone's equal. <laughs> so as we continue through our journey to the business school, you've heard me talk a little bit about the next slide, which is first year advising workshops and intro to business. So every student in the business school takes one of these two things. They're engaged in either an advising workshop or intro to business. I actually teach an intro to business course. This is a one credit hour course that's pretty similar to the workshops. The difference is the depth. Because it's a graded course, students have assignments. They have reflection pieces. In addition to reflecting on different assignments and speakers, they're going to do a four-year curriculum plan that I'm going to grade and walk through with them. You know, they're going to go to um, different workshops on diversity. There, we have an entire series on professional writing. You know, one of their ending deliverables to me or assignments is that they actually have to present an executive summary and present to the class a PowerPoint slideshow on a company that as a group of three to four, they're going to be analyzing, right? So they get a lot of pieces. They have to meet with a, a professional to an informational interview. They have to write emails to me and to other people, thank yous, asking questions, so they learn this business writing. So my intro to business has a little bit more depth and it's open to all business majors. There's, then the first year advising workshops are a little bit more about what do I do with my major? A little bit more about, you know, what are the courses I take? What are the resources on campus? What are some of the opportunities for me to be successful? You know, they're gonna bring in, in addition to me, because I do this as well, we're gonna bring in speakers to talk about study abroad. 
we're going to talk about certifications. You are going to talk about, you know, what are some of the activities I can do with different student clubs and organizations? You know, how am I going to get an internship? All of that gets addressed in both areas. Uh, they're just kind of handled a little bit differently. From there, I mentioned student clubs. So let's talk a little about student clubs. And so, and I'm very excited about this picture. This is one of our annual events, uh, which we refer to as sort of the end of the year barbecue, which by the way, has no longer is a barbecue. It, it originated as a barbecue. Now it's become like whatever the student groups want. Some years it's Quidoba, which is what is featured there. Some years it's been food trucks. Uh, but what normally is part of it is it's a social end of the year gathering, but we have companies that come in, as you can see KPMG is in the background, but there's multiple companies there in a more open environment that's less um, professional as say the career fair, right? This is an opportunity to come and just really learn about a few companies. And so usually we feature about, you know, five to 10 companies where students in a more relaxed environment can ask questions um, and feel more comfortable just asking general questions. So we kind of intentionally set this up to be a place where you can really get to know companies uh, versus feeling more professional with your resume, with your suit on that you might feel at the career fair. Um, and that's something I'll talk about more toward the end. Uh, in the School of Business, we support 12 business clubs, um, and they range from our future fire executives to our finance society, to American Market Association, to the National Association of Black Accountants, like you name it. We have multiple, multiple clubs, all doing good work, putting on events and activities right now, mainly on Zoom. Uh, but we've got some great speakers are rolling out this week and next week. And so it's exciting opportunity to really network, but also kind of learning a little bit more about, again, careers and industries. We have a mentor program. And so this is an optional program for first year students who want to be matched with upper class business students. So we really encourage students. The matching usually happens actually about this week. So students have the first couple of weeks to let us know if they want a mentor. And then they usually get matched up about week three or four with their mentor. Um, one of the highest uh, honors in our school is Beta Gamma Sigma. We actually just won highest honors as a chapter again, which is quote unquote the highest honors you can achieve from Beta Gamma Sigma. So we're really proud of this accomplishment. I think this is our fourth year running of getting highest honors. I'm not gonna lie, I advise them. We take it pretty seriously. We may even call ourselves a little competitive uh, because now that we got it once, I pretty you know I feel like we have to get it every year, right? <laughs> Can't slip up. And so uh, thank goodness the BGS crowd is you know really they're very pro wanting to get this honors and really give back to the rest of the community. In fact, we just launched a um, apparel fundraiser in the School of Business where we're selling apparel on a storefront online and all the proceeds are gonna to go to Rhode Island Food Bank. And the Rhode Island Food Bank has been our um, choice each year to donate for the last four years as we've done this apparel fundraiser in a couple of different variations. And so it's very exciting that actually kicked off this week. Um, You'll we have to send that to the office. I'm sorry? You have, to, you have to send that to the office. I, I will, I will. I never know. I it's, it's a pretty nice pieces, truthfully. Like I have one of the pieces from four years ago and I'm not gonna lie, it's my absolute favorite quarter zip. It has been all over the world. My tumbler so. from your school is my favorite one to use. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, <laughs> I always have plenty of business school swag. Seek me out students. I always know where to get the best stuff. And so we also have a student advisory board and the student advisory board really helps us stay engaged with the students and they're members of all the different clubs. And then similar to our end of the year barbecue, we actually have a kickoff event called the PCSB Involvement Fair. Next slide. So kind of moving along, we have what we call active learning. So this is part of the experiential learning. And so, you know, again, like I said earlier, we want you to do more than just go to class. We want you to apply what you're learning. And so we have what we call real world projects. And these are projects that are given to us by companies they're real projects, they're real data points, um, they're real business problems. And what happens is you work in teams throughout the semester and then you give a deliverable or you give them your to some set of either executives or other members of that company. And they're typically pretty high profile companies. Unfortunately, I sign a lot of NDAs, so non-disclosure agreements. So I can't just literally speak about them. In fact, I was on a call with one of them an hour before this meeting, uh, but to let you know, they're companies that if you put on your resume, people would know who they were and would be impressed. And so we're, you know, engaging more and more of these real world projects. Then we have boot camps, and these tend to be around analytics because although analytics is integrated throughout our curriculum, 
you know, some students are looking for more depth. They really want to get into more of the data visualization. They want to get a little bit more into the weeds on how to more than just collect, but how do I really um, dis discern from this data, like the right information? How do I sell this? How do I tell a story? We use that a lot. How do you tell a story with this data so that my client or my customer, you know, buys my services or my product? And so we spend a lot of time in that in the boot camps. Um, business certifications, like I talked about, many of our county students are leaning toward doing CPAs. You know, many of our students in finance might be thinking CFA, you know, maybe they're looking at Series 7. You know, just depending upon their interests and background, they're going to work with their advisors and they may start pursuing certificates as early as their junior or senior year, depending on their aptitude and their interests. And then for our competitive students, we've got business competitions, both on campus and off campus. So we send students out to other schools to compete. And then we actively actually have our own case competition around ethics. And so in fact, our ethics competition is in November and it's regional. Um, and so we've invited camp students from around the area to compete with our students to come up with the best ethical solutions. Again, I apologize, I can't share because if I gave out the information too early, it would be a advantage or disadvantage to any one group, but it's really fun in the past. Um, it's been like around the ethical dilemmas in concussion research, uh, ethical dilemmas on self-driving or driverless cars. And so it's been really kind of fun topics um, in most cases that the students have really you know, gotten excited about. Uh, in the spring, we'll actually do an internal case competition where students compete with each other uh, for prizes, et cetera. And so typically the students are really active. They're really excited. Not only do they get quote unquote bragging rights um, and featured, but they also win uh, scholarship money as well. And so there's a lot of competitiveness around the ethics competition. But again, we have students that go out to the American Marketing Association. Uh, we have students who go out and they do finance case competitions, mostly around CFA challenge. But there's lots of opportunities for a student who really wants to showcase what they've learned. So next slide. Um, is to talk about global education. And this is so important. To be honest, this is really dear to my heart because I'm, I'm a strong advocate for global education. Um, it's a large part of my role here in the School of Business. We send about 50% of our juniors abroad. Now this is a little bit of an unusual year. Um, however, in typical years, we would send 50% of our juniors abroad. And students have the opportunity to go full semester, we have students who go full year if they're part of the London School of Economics, and we have students who go on what we call short-term faculty-led programs. Um, I've led several short-term faculty programs, both between the undergraduate and the MBA. We've sent students to Australia, to China. Uh, we were about to send students to Ireland. In the past, we've also sent students to France and Spain. So there's usually opportunities within the School of Business. In addition, there are short-term faculty-led programs. Um, held in other disciplines, and a lot of our business majors will choose those because it's not uncommon for those, those faculty-led programs, which are roughly about seven to maybe 12, 14 days. They tend to be centered around a course or a topic. And so for a lot of our students, they really want to take some of the topics outside the business school. So for example, there's a program, one of my favorites is, um, goes to Japan and it's a fine arts course. And so it's very photography based. And so it's a really exciting opportunity for a student who really wants to get out to Asia, but also fulfill one of their fine arts requirements. Uh, similarly, any of our students who are studying foreign language, which is ironically the next slide, which we certainly encourage, there are a lot of opportunities for some of the faculty led as well as full semester abroad. Now in the School of Business, we do not require foreign language, but we certainly encourage it right, because business is so global. So knowing a second language is certainly to your advantage. Because again, I think if you heard any message from me, it's creating this opportunity to showcase yourself and your skills to employers. Um, really, we want you to be holistic and the best prepared job seeker. And so having said that, you know, one of the new initiatives, and next year would be going year three, is we partnered with our foreign language studies department, specifically Spanish, to develop a Spanish for business communication class. So this is a class that's both the culture of business as well as continuing to enhance your language skills. So it's a real win-win course uh, that a lot of our students really enjoy taking because you know it gives you, I think, that breadth of knowledge and feel more comfortable that if you decide to study abroad in a, a country where you're speaking Spanish, you're going to feel a lot more prepared on the internship. Um, and so in the School of Business, we do require students engage in experiential learning opportunities while abroad. 
I would say in about 95% or more cases, that's likely going to be an internship abroad. We work with you to get those internships. It's really a win-win in my mind. You know, not only are you gaining more work experience, which looks, which looks fantastic on your resume, but you're also immersing yourself in a culture. You're really getting a sense of what it's like to work overseas. What would it be like to be on a diverse team, a global team? And we know for a lot of companies, teams are global. So it really gives you an opportunity to really get a sense of what it might be like to work on a global team. And we really think this is like a win-win. We've had students have tremendous internship experiences. Like I had a student who was in London working for a hedge fund. What a fantastic experience for a finance major. He came back quote unquote glowing. Like he couldn't speak any more highly about his experience. And that's just one of many examples. And I know I've got to kind of move this along because Lynn's going to give me the keep moving speech. So let me move on to the next slide. We're close because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so this is really my last slide because, you know, what outcomes driven in the business school. So, you know, our students get jobs. You know, when you look at our data points, which you're going to see, you know, 99, 98% of our students will have made, will have jobs. We have nearly 100 students will have an internship. So many of our students have part-time jobs. And we partner quite, quite a bit with the career education and professional development to showcase these opportunities. And so there's lots of resources with career education and professional development to help you find and obtain an internship. Look for that full-time job. If you're still, like I talked about, exploring, there's a winter shadow program. There are alumni networking events. There's literally a, an alumni program where you can reach out to an alum and ask questions, do an informational interview, find out what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then they also showcase as part of our FLIP program, so we kind of partner quite a bit with Career Education on the Fire Leadership and Immersion Program. Under that umbrella, or excuse me, reverse that, under the umbrella of the Friar Involvement Tracker is FLIP as well as the Friar Four Career Core. And these are lots of opportunities to learn about how to gain knowledge and experience or skills to present yourself well in the workplace. So for example, resume workshops are underneath this. Um, in addition to that, there's gonna be workshops on, you know, how do you effectively communicate? How do you interview well? How do you do an informational interview? How do you feature yourself on LinkedIn? And how do you use social media? Um, in addition to that, we also, through career education, we partner that all of our business students can be Excel certified, right? You definitely want to put that in your resume that you can use Excel. There's not too many employers interested who is not interested in learning more about your Excel skills. In fact, number one piece of advice I would give to business majors, make sure you're good at Excel. Keep using it regardless of your major, because the better you're at Excel, the happier you're going to be in your jobs. So having said that, I want to leave some time for Q&A. Thank you so much for letting me be here and welcome to campus. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Elsek. You do such a great job that it makes me want to go back and redo my major. Love my program, but I'm also like, what else could I have learned? Um, so uh, we do have a question um, that's a little bit more admission related. So I'm going to save that one towards the end. Um, but students, do you have any um, PCSB Providence School of Business uh, related questions that we can talk through at this point? I'll give it a moment to come through on the Q&A feature. Um, there we go. Uh, and I do, I'm going to share my own little snippet before I ask the question of just those May master programs, those abroad programs in the month of May um, that Dr. Elsek touched upon, I had taken advantage of one when I was a student and it was great to meet students from other programs that were doing exactly as you shared, um, taking care of core requirement classes or fulfilling minor requirements or different things like that. And it's great to not have to give up a full summer for that type of program. Um, but we have one asking about handling double majors within the school of business or even outside of it. Mm -hmm. So part of our first year advising workshops and series, uh, we'll start touching upon the curriculum first thing, um, because it's, it's very reasonable to double major within business. It's also very reasonable to double major across campus. Um, and a lot of this has to do with your interests as a student. 
And so I know when I work with my advisees and I can speak that a lot of the faculty do this as well, like I sit down and I map out like a four year curriculum with my students and we review this over and over again to make sure that if you wanna have a double major, that we're making sure you're on track to do that. I would tell you double majoring does kind of require knowing pretty early on um, that you have that interest. Uh, because usually you need to use like pretty much like all your 120 credit hours to get to a double major, especially if it's outside the business school. Um, some majors are a little bit easier than others to double major just, just from a credit hour standpoint. Uh, certainly if you want to take additional coursework, always easy to do. But if you're starting to stay on track being a little closer to the 120, 122 requirement, then really, you know, you got to be kind of careful and planning. You know, wh where I see a lot of natural um, relationships is is non-common see accounting and finance together surprisingly marketing and finance are pretty common um, we do offer three minors we have accounting and finance and then marketing but marketing is for non-business majors so those are all opportunities as well um, I see a lot of relationships with foreign language studies history um, English for our marketing majors who are kind of looking for that like public relations piece you know, they want to have the analytics and the business side that comes with our marketing degree, but they really want the kind of creative and writing side that might come from English. That's a, that's a strong pairing right there. You know, sometimes I'll see students surprisingly minor in philosophy. I wouldn't have thought of that initially, but that has been a growing minor for us. I think it's the critical thinking piece that a lot of our business majors really gravitate toward. And so they really enjoy that. Obviously, I think also like econ is a very common double major or minor. Um, so you see some of the natural relationships that anything across campus you can double major in. You know, one I think would be really natural would be psychology or sociology with management. I see a little less of that, but it does come up from time to time, just because there is some, like, depending what you want to do in management, there's some um, areas that are pretty similar in this organizational behavior and how you think about people, teams, individuals, you know, but, you know, students just design what they're most interested in. Absolutely. Um, we have a couple that, again, are admission related. So students, I promise I'll get to those at the end. Um, I don't want to take up too much of Dr. Elsick's time or run into Dr. Van Reet's. Um, but question about just the accounting program, if you could touch on that really quick. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so you know, we have obviously an accounting program and those students do take in addition to the core I talked about, they take eight accounting courses. I would tell you the majority of our students are very CPA focused. Um, and so the program itself is fairly CPA focused. Uh, the students get a lot of attention between the departments and the accounting association. Big four accounting firms as well as other accounting firms are on campus regularly. In fact, I know each week since school has started, we have an accounting firm uh, that's attending the accounting association Zoom sessions. And so each week they come in, they feature, you know, what are, what are their jobs, what are their pathways, what are options if I'm a first year sophomore, junior, or senior. Um, I would tell you from pretty much day one through our first year advising workshop, the accounting students are going to hear about CPA, they're going to hear about the requirements for CPA, they're going to hear about the credit hours are required. Uh, we also have a four plus one MBA program. Uh, we have an accounting uh, arm of that, meaning we have one group of what we call accounting cohort students. Uh, accounting students can go into what, what I call the four plus one MBA as well. So the student wants to stay for a fifth year and also study for their CPA is a great option. And so anybody who wants to talk about that, reach out to me. Um, I work with that all the time. Um, it's a very popular program. Uh, it does usually require it, you know, um, applying early if you want to spot in the accounting cohort. Um, so again, we, we're informing students from day one about that. So don't worry, lots of opportunities to hear about it. Perfect. Um, I think this one's really great. Any advice for how to decide between economics and one of your business programs? Absolutely. I mean, the most logical alliance is going to be econ and finance. And if you think of it this way, you know, finance grew from econ. And so, it, you know, in many ways, it's really picking whichever one you're most interested in. So this is where I think the first year is a great time to explore. If you're in the business school, you can easily be taking your first two econs here and then even try to take second semester or even first semester sophomore year, the finance course. And this would help you figure out what your interests are. But they are very similar. I would say one of the biggest differences if you're in the business school, you're going to take all the business courses. 
right? All the core classes. Now, if you're over in econ, you have a couple of different options. You could go business econ, which truthfully seems very similar to our business program because there's a lot of overlap with the core classes. Not 100%, but there's certainly a fair amount. But there are other econ options depending upon how you want to use the econ degree. So I would tell you that's, that's, I would tell you when you come to campus and you're on all the other admission events, talk to some of the faculty, get their opinion, get their thoughts. You know, I'm always a little biased. I say, come to business school, take your two econ classes, sort it out. But I feel pretty confident if my econ counterpart was here, they'd probably say the exact same thing. So the point is you can't go wrong. You can go either direction and then just see which one's the better fit for you. Or truthfully, you can major in one and minor in the other or vice versa. That happens very frequently. Absolutely. And when you all attend our follow up in house on Saturday, October 17th, you can hear from both. Uh, that's my own little admission plug. Um, asking about career fairs and other opportunities to make connections from that internship perspective as freshmen and sophomores. Um, what does that look like? Absolutely. Uh, we always encourage our first year and sophomores to attend the career fair. We hold two career fair slash expos each year. Um, they're held by our career education office. They take the lead on this. It usually sh showcases anywhere from 100 to 150 employers. Uh, we do try to have sessions prior to that leading up to kind of coaching you on how to you approach the career fair. In addition to that, many of the clubs and organizations in the business school will feature companies. We also in the business school will feature panels. Like, so give me an idea I had a group of panelists from Fidelity just last week. I just put together a panel from people from City, BNY Mellon, State Street, they're coming in in October. Two of the accounting um, companies, big four, one came in last week, one's coming this week. I know there's another one slated for next week, et cetera. They'll be in here all the time. Uh, depending upon the year, you know, we might have an involvement fair that kicks off with three to five employers end of the year fair, three to five employers. In some years, because we have a beautiful building that has an atrium, frequently employers are literally just standing in, in the atrium with all their swag and glory. So as you walk by, they're giving out free goodies, sometimes free food, sometimes both, you know, because they like to give out branded swag as much as the business school does. Um, and they have their pop-ups and so you can't miss who they are. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities to engage but also if you need more coaching, that's where your faculty advisor or career education really come into play to help you with that kind of coaching piece. How do you really go up and have those conversations if you need a little bit more support? Perfect. Um, this is gonna be our last question and then students, I promise, I know there are some that are a little more admission oriented that I will get to at the end, um, but it's asking what typical business classes look like. Is it lecture based or hands-on? Okay, it's a little bit of all, I would say. Um, Depending upon which courses you're taking, they have probably a little bit of blend. A fair number of business classes are gonna have teamwork. And so either you're in teams and classes or you're teams and projects or you're both. So I consider that to be pretty hands-on. It's not uncommon for you to go to class and have to read a case and then speak to the case and speak to how what you're learning in class applies to that case. I think of that as a little bit hands-on. Obviously, if you did like the real world projects I spoke about, those are very hands on. I mean, that's literally like a company gave you a business problem and you're working in teams much like you would in a workplace to come up with solutions like as if your actual employer gave you a project to work on. Very similar. So it's, it's essentially replicating that same experience. But obviously there's gonna be some lectures. You know, you're gonna hear from faculty in accounting and marketing. They're gonna give you some of that discipline specific, but they're also gonna expect you to read on your own and be prepared. So sometimes you'll come into class and it could be discussion based, okay? You know, you read X, Y, Z, talk to me. Here's some questions to prompt discussion. You know, it could be that same class, like I said, you come in, you do a case, or it could be immediately everybody get out your spreadsheets because we're looking at data analytics. Right, so now we're gonna put up on the screens, people's Excel spreadsheets, what were your solutions, what are your findings, what's your story that goes behind this? So it's hard to answer a question because I think it's a blend of all those things. Some classes will have all of that. I would tell you that I think, I think the idea of sitting in class and being lectured at is pretty rare now in the business school. Yeah, I do not hear very often from students that they showed up to class and were lectured. I think most classes, the faculty now know in the last five to 10 years that that the way students learn has to be a blend of all of that. And hopefully that answers the question. Do you feel that did Liz? I think so, yeah. And I think that 
really speaks to the entire Providence College experience of you're going to have that mixture within all of your classes. So I do thank you um, for sharing that answer with us. Um, students, we'll get to the other ones shortly. Uh, I just want to allow Dr. Van Riet to come on over and share the next piece of our afternoon. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Elsek. It was wonderful to have you share everything. And I'll definitely, next time I'm on campus, come grab some new swag from you all. Always welcome. And all of you, you're always welcome. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. Good luck. Thank you. All right, Dr. Van Riet is waiting in the queue. So we will have her join us now. Wonderful. Sorry, it was taking a little bit longer, but we had some really great questions for students to go through. Oh, no problem. Hey, I, I like listening to Dean Elsig too. <laughs> I always learn something. Exactly. Um, so students, we're going to transition over to really what that academic excellence stands for at Providence College, specifically through the Center for Engaged Learning. Um, Dr. Van Reet, while I didn't have her as a professor, is one of our very esteemed psychology professors on campus. Um, so feel free to take it away. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so as you just heard, I am a professor of psychology, as well as the director of something we call the Center for Engaged Learning. And so I'm actually going to pick up on some of the same themes as Dean Elsick said, um, because a lot of what she talked about are hallmarks of a Providence College education um, in all areas, uh, definitely in the business school, but also in the other schools as well. The Center for Engaged Learning is an entity which is available college-wide. So we offer a variety of different supports and programs to um, mostly um, students within our three main schools, the School of Business, um, the School of Arts and Sciences, and the School of, of Professional Studies. And so we're really thinking big, big and broad about how we can support students in all of uh, uh, all majors, all disciplines, anything you're studying, how to be a more engaged learner. Um, and because really, I think that you can be an engaged learner in lots of different ways. So you can be an engaged learner in an internship and a global ed experience like you just heard about. Um, you can also be an engaged learner sitting in a development of Western Civ lecture. Um, you know, so we think about lots of different levels of engagement. All right, and because I'm a professor, I have slides. It's just like, it's an occupational hazard. I promise there are not many and there's lots of pictures. So let me share these just real quick. Um, this actually just helps me stay on track so that I don't go off on tangents uh, for you guys. Um, so I just wanna summarize the, some of the main initiatives uh, that the Center for Engaged Learning is doing right now, just to give you guys a flavor for some of the supports that we have in place for Providence College students. Um, so the first theme is to help uh, ease the transition to college and prepare students for success at BC. Um, so one of the things that the Center for Engaged Learning does is we run this course called Intro to PC, or Introduction to Providence College, if you want to say the whole thing. This is similar to the Intro to Business course that, that Dean Elsick talked about, um, but this one is for students who aren't in the business school. Um, and may not have access to this sort of course in their own major. Um, primarily, students are, who are undeclared enroll in the class, but we have, do have students from a, a large number of different majors. Um, so, you know, anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of our incoming first year students are undeclared, and we really think that they need an intro class too, right? So they need a place to really help them transition from high school to college, to really integrate into the Providence College community. Um, the course is taught by your academic advisor, which is one of the huge strengths. It's a one credit course, so it meets once a week. Um, it is an academic course, so there's some reading and writing involved, but the whole course is structured so that your advisor gets to know you, you get to know your advisor, and you think intentionally and thoughtfully about what you want out of your PC education. And you make a plan for what sorts of experiences do you wanna make sure you have? What are your goals? And you chart out a pathway to reach those goals. So it's a really valuable experience. Um, it's been very successful. We've had it for four or five years now, and it's only growing and growing and growing. So this year, we have somewhere between 200 and 300 students enrolled in this version, and then, there are hundreds and hundreds of students enrolled in some of the things 
the first year advising workshop and intro to business like you just heard about. Um, we also run something for faculty and students regarding resilience. And so this is another um, important su uh, skill for academic success at PC. So we really believe in the power of building up academic resilience skills, which has been so important, especially during this past um, calendar year. And so we have a program um, sponsored by an alum, uh, Chris Recobono, who you see here up on the screen, that provides specific supports to faculty members um, who build in academic resilience into their courses. And we have professors in all of the schools, business, arts and sciences, professional studies, who are doing this right now. So they, they're relating resilience to biology or health policy or psychology or sociology or global studies, whatever they teach, they're actually teaching resilience within the course. And we have some really good data suggesting that it works. Um, so students who are in these courses actually do uh, build some resilience skills, and, which is a really exciting initiative. Uh, number two, so we give a lot of support to help faculty and staff provide engaging experiences. Um, and this could be in the classroom, like I was talking about, being engaged actually in your civ lecture or outside of the classroom experiences um, when we're able. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of some things that we have done in previous years. Uh, obviously, this year is a little bit different, but we've highlighted reflective practice um, and provided materials to professors to help do more good reflection work in classes. Um, we've bought some equipment to do sort of virtual reality in classes. So we have a faculty member in the art department who teaches art through virtual reality. Very, very, very cool, very fun. Um, we send students to uh, local sites. Um, and so in this case, this was a play that was happening in downtown Providence that was related to what was being talked about in the development of Western civilization. So the students went to see the play. So we send students to shows. Uh, we send students to take tours of local historical sites. Um, or we bring guest speakers into the classroom. And this is actually something we're still doing just virtually, right? Inviting guest speakers to come into the, the classroom. Um, in terms of business, right, we, we help sponsor student travel to conferences and competitions. So in this case, this was a startup challenge that the Providence College team actually won third place. We were very proud of them. It was the very first time they had participated in this particular competition. Number three, uh, so a big part of our work is advising and coaching students through the process of applying for fellowships and scholarships for postgrad, postgraduate life. Um, for a whole range of, of postgraduate fellowships and scholarships. So we start working with students very early, sometimes even first and second year students, and then really big time in the third year. Um, but you can get involved in starting to gear your path toward a postgraduate fellowship or scholarship very early on and be advised and coached for that. So what am I talking about? What are some examples? Um, so one of the, the big ones is our, the Fulbright program. And the Fulbright program is a program um, that's run for the US State Department, which sends students to international sites to other countries um, and all over the world for a year. And they do various activities. So um, sometimes they work as educators, right? Sometimes they work as researchers. Um, sometimes they actually are students, so they're doing graduate work on their on their Fulbright year. And we have been very successful, especially in the past few years, in the number of Fulbright recipients that we have received. Um, so last year, we had three students be offered Fulbright awards, all of them to teach English. Um, we had a notable honorable mention um, for a student to do her master's work in England. Um, and then, so examples of other types of fellowships. So Humanity in Action is a very uh, nationally competitive fellowship. We had a winner last year, Sean Gray, who's a history major. Um, and even though the program had to be virtual this year, he participated, he got a lot out of that. 
um, in previous years, just other examples of our Fulbright winners and the places that they've been. Another example is uh, the Goldwater Scholarship, which is a very competitive scholarship in the sciences. Um, and we were so happy and honored to have one of our majors um, win the Goldwater recently. And uh, so we were very proud of her um, because that was, this is a, a, a really, really prestigious fellowship. All right, last but not least, uh, my, my favorite initiative of the Center for Engaged Learning is to support student research and creative work. Um, so we know that there's lots of data to suggest that doing research and doing other types of creative work in college is one of the best ways to build all sorts of skills like critical thinking and communication, but also skills that are really valuable to employers and graduate schools like time management and project management and teamwork and leadership. So we run a major um, showcase of all of the student scholarship and creative work. And we do that every year in April. Um, we even did it last year. We did not cancel it uh, because it's really so important and so fundamental to, to showcase all of the really hard work that students have done over the course of the year. Um, so what we did is in March when we shut down, we um, very rapidly pivoted and we did a, a whole day of an online showcase. And that showcase is actually still live. Um, so I would encourage you to actually go look at some of the student work that's been done because it's still up and it's, it's really amazing. We run two grants programs which support student scholarship. So students of any discipline can apply for a grant to do a project. And we do that in the academic year, but also in the summer. So here's an example of a summer project. And in the summer, what we do is we pay students a stipend. So we basically say like, look, we are gonna pay you to just do research for 10 weeks over the summer. Don't go get a summer job, don't do anything else. We will pay you to just have this research experience. Um, and the type of things that people learn and people, the things that people discover when they're doing this is pretty, is pretty amazing. Um, so here's an example of a biology student who studied ants in Rhode Island over the summer. Um, another example of a student who was working with, uh, I believe in sociology and global studies, um, conducting participant interviews in New Jersey. Um, this student, a film student, we sent her to France for the film festival over the summer. Um, and she did uh, a wonderful project related to uh, film criticism. Uh, another global studies project. Uh, and you can really see from some of these quotes that having these experiences changes the trajectory of people's lives basically, because it, it really changes what you think that you can do and what your interests are and what your passions are. And um, it inspires a lot of students to either change fields or change plans for what they wanna do after graduation, because it's a very intensive experience. Um, I don't have quotes from these past summer projects because we're still gathering all the data, uh, but we did have a, a summer 2020 program. We, we did not cancel it. Um, I'm really proud of this. A lot of schools did have to cancel their summer research programs, but we found a way to make it work. Um, so we were able to support 15 different students. I don't have a picture of all of them, I'm sorry, but from a variety of different majors across campus, from management to biology and chemistry to education um, to psychology, and they spent their summers digging through archives and interviewing children on Zoom and um, actually working in the science labs under very strict safety protocols. Um, so lots of really cool work happened even in the midst of the pandemic this summer. So that's all, um, a quick little run through of the types of things we do. Uh, feel free to reach out at any time and I'm happy if you guys have questions. Yeah, absolutely. Students continue to use that Q&A feature. Um, thank you, Dr. Van Reith. Uh, it's always so amazing to hear what our students are able to accomplish during their four years. Um, it, it, 
they accomplish so much in the classroom to begin with and then to see that above and beyond piece of it um, and to know that the college is really there to support and encourage all of this extra type of academic experience. Um, but we'll give the students just a moment to see if they are typing. Uh, Absolutely. You know, one thing that I love is that um, every year through our, our research projects and other initiatives, students actually create new knowledge. So they, they discover things and they um, put new things out in the world that, that no one has ever known before. And I think that is so wonderful where you can, and I think so many times students think that, oh, I'm just going to learn stuff from other people. But no, they're the ones actually creating new knowledge and teaching, teaching the rest of us about, about their field. And I think it's so special to being that primarily undergraduate school. This is the student driven piece of it. It's not faculty saying, oh, I'll have people join me. It's the students coming up with new questions and finding what they want to study. Uh, so I'm not Absolutely. seeing any questions come through at this point, but we want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Sure. Um, Absolutely. And have a good night. Thank you so much. All righty. We are on to our next piece of everything. I will have our students join us now. Um, more and Billy down at the bottom. All righty. Get all of our new co-hosts here. That, hi guys, Joseph, give me one second. There we go. Perfect. Hi everyone, it's good to see you guys. Nice to see you as well. How's it going? Uh, so for the final piece of it, I uh, really just want to give you that true current story. Um, we would love to invite all of our prospective students back to campus to shadow our current students for the day. Um, unfortunately, just not the best decision to do at this time, um, but we really hope that this gives you the best way to hear more of that student to student interaction. All four of our panelists fall under that school of business theme that we've been talking about today. Uh, so if you guys want to do a quick little intro name major where you're from class year, if you want to throw a fun fact in there. I'm here for it. Uh, but this is really your final 20 minutes to run the show and answer questions for our students. Yeah, you're at the top of it. Oh, go Jack. Here we oh, go. Sorry. Uh, so my name is Jack McKean. Uh, I'm a current senior on campus, or I guess off campus. Um, and I'm a marketing major with a writing minor. Uh, and I'm originally from Sudbury, Massachusetts. Um, hi, oh, sorry, <laughs> you are doing that. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, my name is Grace Whitman. I'm a junior finance major and political science minor um, from Orange, Connecticut. What's up guys, my name is Joseph Boyega. I'm a junior marketing and finance double major and I'm from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Hello, my name is Billy Honey. I'm a junior finance major, Spanish minor from Park City, Utah. And some things besides finance and Spanish that I'm involved with on campus is Friars Club, Campus Ministry, MBK, My Brother's Keeper, Friar Fanatics. I think we're all Friar Fanatics at the end of the day. I uh, can't wait for basketball season to come back. Um, so prospective students, feel free. This is really your time. I'm actually going to turn my camera off. I will keep my mic on so I can read the questions out loud. Um, but this is your time to have that student to student conversation. Um, I promise the admission related questions that have been asked, I will answer at the end. Um, but this is your opportunity to ask those, what does class look like? How much homework do you have? How was it becoming a school business student? Um, do you have plans after graduation? Sorry to bring up the G word. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Jack. Um, and really just those next steps kind of thing. Um, if anybody has a touch point that I've brought up already, go ahead. Um, otherwise, we'll wait for questions to come through in the Q&A. Any internships you want to share? Um, real quick, I was in, I came in a little bit early, so I was listening when Dean Elsick was mentioning about um, how heavy group work 
uh, how much group work we do in the business school. And it was funny, I had to just sit back and smile my camera off because I was coming straight from a group meeting on Zoom into, the, <laughs> into this Zoom. So business school is definitely um, heavy group work. It stresses that, you know, like teamwork and office culture that you'll see post-PC, post-grad, um, and wherever else that takes you. And um, in terms of internships, I am fresh off an internship with EY Ernst & Young this past summer in their financial services organization. Um, I was there as a launch intern, so it was, it was a rotational internship, but my focus was in consulting. Um, and it, it brought kind of the marketing element and the finance element, um, both of which I'd only take one course at the time, to a corporate environment, so. Perfect, thank you. Um, can somebody touch upon if the course load for a double major is overwhelming and what that looks like? I guess that one I can also take. Um, <laughs> take that one semester at a time. Um, I can't really, I don't really look at the, like the, the course load itself per semester, I would say is about the same because you're still taking the same number of courses for the most, we have six and typically we'd have five, but in a semester that you have five, you'd have five classes, um, for a majority of the majors on campus, if anybody else wants to correct me if I'm wrong on that, but majority of majors, you would have five courses anyway, so the workload is going to be the same. Um, and what I tell people, like PC is a high academic institution, like it's like the, the courses are going to be rigorous for some. When it comes to the business classes, um, it might not even be the work particular, it's the amount of group projects that you'll have. So if you have two or three business courses, that means there's a good chance you have two or three group projects that you have to work on. So finding that balance and being able to be flexible with your meeting schedules and all that becomes very important. That's what um, really feels like a lot during the course of a semester. Um, just to bounce off that, I'm not a double major, but I know a lot of people who are, um, especially in the business school, a lot of the courses that you have to take um, line up. So for example, as a finance major or marketing or management, you still have to take two accounting courses. So you're already like kind of part the way there to getting an accounting degree. Um, and there's a lot more examples through the other classes you have to take. Um, but the, the business school curriculum, um, you know, dabbles in each one of the majors. So um, in that sense, it's, uh, it's not too difficult to either double major in, um, in business or have a minor um, in any of the uh, colleges in at Providence. Perfect. Can you talk a little bit about the transition academically from high school to Providence? Uh, yeah, I can touch on that. Um, so I'm originally from Sunbury, Massachusetts. So I went to Lincoln Sunbury High School, um, which was just like public school. Uh, and I felt uh, like the work, the transition was uh, manageable. I mean, it, it is different. Like you have a lot more work when you get here. Um, and I think that's anywhere you go. Um, and it definitely is manageable. Uh, PC does a great job of, uh, you know, pairing you with your advisor who is sort of always there. The professors do a great job of um, being there for office hours, uh, which they want you to take advantage of. So I, I felt that um, it wasn't, it was manageable. It was definitely um, an adjustment, but, you know, as you get into it uh, between professors and other students, it, it, it is manageable. For me, I think the most important part of my transition was like learning time management. I know you're going to hear this a thousand times over in like every single school you guys listen to and have these seminars, but really coming to understand that like in college, you're spending three hours a week in the classroom versus in high school where you're spending that same class maybe like 10 hours a week in the classroom. And so you're really flipping it. So instead of you having three hours of homework, 10 hours in the classroom, now you're going to be spending 10, maybe not 10 hours of work, but you're going to spend significantly more time outside the classroom working on the class. And for me at PC, like the most important part of my like college workload transition was using the writing center and using the tutoring center. PC does an absolutely fantastic job of making COVID. Like my first essay was due for this honors writing class I had last week. And I had two online appointments where it took me, like I sat down for a half hour, they went over my essays, and they really do a fantastic job. And they have these tutors available seven days a week. And I think you'll need like 48 hours in advance to schedule these meetings. So they really do, do a good job. For all your other classes besides like writing, they have tutors for every single class on campus. And 90% of the times they have a tutor who had the same professor as you, which makes it super helpful for me. Sophomore year, my 
statistics teacher. I had a tutor who, and the tutor had the same professor as me. So when I was coming up for that first exam, he was able to show me like what, how he, the professor lays out his exams, which I found super, super helpful. Perfect, that was awesome. Thanks guys. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what student and community life looks like on campus? Billy, I know you touched a little bit upon other things you're involved with, but um, what that student experience really looks like. Sure. Um, one thing I would love to say about like PC students is I would say we're engaged as a community. So whatever you're passionate about or whatever you really want to be a part of at PC, it really is an opportunity for that. So if you love basketball, you love hockey, and you want to be at every single game, being in the front row, handing out the posters, like handing out the flyers, like all that good stuff, like that opportunity is totally going to be there for you. But at the same time, if you're really passionate about community service, the school has an entire fleet of cars for you to take out and for you to loan, for you to go out into the community and do community service. If you're passionate about art or you will love club sports or intramural sports, you have the number one intramural program in the country. So like, depending on what you're interested in and what you really want to do at school, it's really up to you. But one thing that I love about PC is like the engaged. Like if I was to pick one word to describe a PC student, I would say engaged. Perfect. Jack, I think this only applies to you, but uh, can you talk a little bit about study abroad? Yeah, I think uh, everyone else is juniors here. So I, I had a bit of a uh, interesting experience. I went abroad uh, last semester in the spring. Uh, so I was actually sent home. Uh, That's I went what I was afraid of. <laughs> right. Um, but that being said, uh, I do still have a ton of good things to say about it. Uh, the time I was there was an absolutely unbelievable experience. I went to Rome through PC and Rome. Um, which was good because it was a lot of PC kids, but then, um, you know, there were a lot of kids from other schools as well. Um, so, you know, I, I loved it. Um, and I will say, while we did get sent home, uh, both our program, uh, program in Florence and in Milan, uh, everyone got home safely, uh, and the school did a great job of communicating with us, um, you know, what was going on, and, and if we wanted to say, this is what we're going to have to do, uh, and, you know, taking care of us. So, um, you know, that's just, uh, once in a once in a million one in a million uh, thing that's going to happen, but they did a great job of managing it. Uh, and the experience that I did have uh, was still a ton of fun. And I know a ton of other kids who went abroad to everywhere from Australia, all over Europe, um, all over the place. And people just have great experiences with that. Uh, and I would definitely recommend it um, if you're thinking about it. So I wasn't able to go abroad because of COVID. Um, but one thing I will say about the Center for Study Abroad is that like, I wanted to do a program that PC hadn't already pre-approved, and they were super helpful of making sure that program got approved. It was obviously a lot of work on my end, but they didn't make it a hassle. I didn't feel like they were trying to impede me. So if there's somewhere where you're like, I don't know, I've always wanted to go study, I don't know, in Kenya, let's say, but PC have never sent anyone to Kenya, and they don't have a program there. If you can find a program and show them you're really interested and passionate, they will find a way for you to get that program. So. I will have to say, Jack, I'm so sorry. I did go to PC in Rome when I was a student. So to relive my glory days, um, it is a really great opportunity to take advantage of. Um, I think this is a really great question. Uh, what's the best class in the School of Business? Or follow up, whichever way you want to do this. Uh, finish the sentence, don't graduate from PC before you take a class with this professor and why. Before I get into my answer, I don't know if I could tell you don't graduate from PC until you take a professor because course registration can be tough. So I'm not going to tell you to um, hold your graduation without taking a certain professor that there's a chance you may. Um, but I think I've, I want to say I've had maybe a like favorite professor, or favorite course in just about um, every major in the business school. So for financial and managerial accounting, I had Professor Peterson um really great accounting was not something i was considering for a major and she had me almost ready to declare accounting um as a freshman and now my junior year there was absolutely no way i was going to do that but she that's how much I, I liked her as a professor she almost had me thinking that in the finance department um professor collins has been one of my favorites for management i had professor shibler last spring he was great for organization and behavior um and for marketing right now i have professor latorno and so those would probably be my four go-to in the business school if you can get them. Uh, just to bounce off what Joseph said, uh, I'm a marketing major. For those of you who are thinking about marketing, uh, Professor Letourneau uh, is absolutely the best professor I had here. 
Um, she just cares so much about her students. And I know there's another question about uh, in there about uh, building relationships with your professors. Um, and she was great at that. She always had office hours every time we went in. Uh, you know, she'd spend, you know, you show up to class early, she'd be sitting there talking to you like, how's oh, the weekend? You just get to know her. Um, easily one of the best professors. And a lot of the professors across the um, School of Business and even Campus Wider like that, Will Barrow, where they'll be there for you to, to build relationships, get you in office hours and get to know you. So uh, to answer that question, uh, a little prematurely, but uh, there are tons of examples um, and opportunities to do that. Um, so I came into Providence as an accounting major. Um, I did switch to finance. But um, I would say one of my favorite teachers at Providence in the business school is Professor Caselius of the accounting department. Um, I had him for the full, my full freshman year in financial accounting and managerial accounting. Um, and he would host office hours, um, which is um, just a way for students to come and um, ask questions for their teacher, with their teachers and you know, group, group work. Um, with their teacher. So I took advantage of that so much and he was so helpful in that way. Um, but also um, he got me connected with um, PwC, which is a big four accounting firm. Um, so even as a freshman, I was able to go into their Boston office and kind of do an explore day. Um, so um, although he was such a great teacher in the classroom, he gave me opportunities outside the classroom. So I um, highly recommend if uh, that you get him. So. I have to back up Joseph here. Val Peterson was definitely my probably my favorite professor in the business school. I had her as well for both fall and spring semester freshman year. And she was just one of those teachers that like she you could tell she cared a ton about every single student, but also she went out of the way of having her office hours, but also having like additional drop in sessions and like having additional worksheets because accounting is one of those classes where it's just repetition. It's not like anyone's like naturally gifted at accounting. It's like one of those things where everyone just has to learn. It's doing it over and over again. And so she did an absolutely fantastic job. So I'd definitely say if you get the opportunity to take her, that would be my number one choice. Glowing recommendations all around. Um, thank you, Jack, for that other question, um, which was going to be the next one I was gonna throw at you guys, of just creating those relationships with professors. We've used a lot of kind of college terms as we keep talking, advisors being those, not guidance counselors, but almost guidance counselor kind of role within your major, that person who's there to help you choose your classes, make sure that you're being successful within your program, office hours being those somewhat extra, like after school hours where your professor literally just sits in their office with the door open, looking for you to come in and make those connections, whether it is that homework help or more just life conversations, how you're gonna get that connection with PwC, like Grace just said. Um, but if you wanna talk about that relationship, building within school of business um for for me well it's it it's a two-way relationship right so when it comes to relationships with all your professors not just in the business school it's about you i think majority of the business school professors will say that they're they're open to relationships but um it's not high school it's not middle school there is no like parent teacher conference so they're not going to schedule that time for you to mandate like it's not mandatory that you show up to their office hours except maybe for a project here and there but for you to really build that relationship is you really like going to their office hours and actually just speaking with them and like when it comes to like i mentioned professor peterson that Billy was talking about every Monday and I would go um, to work on my Wiley Plus assignments or sometimes I would just go and like listen to other people's questions. And if and there were times where there was no in the semester when everybody's like, man, I don't, I really don't wanna go down to lower campus to go look, to go do some homework or I don't have a question for the professor. And I would try to get myself to go and the, the more you go, then it's like, there's times where you're just there with the professor one-on-one -on -one talking. And she would mention just like, um, try, try to get my interest to certain things that I hadn't been exposed to prior to PC, so. Awesome, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just keep moving a little bit. Grace, this might be more for you. Um, asking about switching, or which did you find harder, accounting or finance, vice versa? How do you make that switch of majors, that sort of thing? Uh, again, from my own glory days, they were both the trouble for me. This was why I studied a different program. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, um, in the business school, there's a lot of overlap in the classes you need to take. Um, so after my freshman year, um, after every, every freshman business student, uh, after the first year, they still don't need to take a finance class. Um, so I found that really helpful because um, 
I took a finance class my first semester sophomore year and was still on track, like I had to as an accounting major. Um, so after my first finance class, I decided that that was just a better fit for me. Um, I wanna go to law school after I graduate. So um, I just felt like it matched better with my um, future goals, but um, I found it really easy. Um, I went to my advisor and you know laid out a plan on how I wanna go about doing this and which classes I needed to take to graduate. And it was really actually pretty easy. Um, so I think that's a great aspect of the business school because there's so many overlapping classes. Absolutely. Anybody else have an opinion of accounting versus finance? They're both very numbers driven. Um, really great question of what advice would you give to an incoming freshman for next year? Um, what words of wisdom do you all have to share with our prospective students right now? Uh, a big thing for me uh, was just uh, part of freshman year, obviously, is, you know, going to class and, and making sure your grades stay up, but it's also trying to sort of find your place on campus. Um, and I would say go to what we have, the involvement fair, where um, every single club on campus shows up and they have tables, or I guess this year they did it on Zoom uh, because of COVID. But um, make sure you're there and, and find clubs that are interesting to you. Um, so my freshman year, I had no idea really what I wanted to do. Uh, I joined Six Gen Sketch Comedy. Um, which I'd never done any acting, never done anything like that. Uh, and it was, I'm actually now the vice president uh, and it's been one of the best experiences. Same is true of the Friars Club. Um, I went, I didn't really know what it was. Um, and you gotta just kind of put yourself out there, uh, go for interviews. A lot of them will just have you put your email down and you don't have to join if you don't want to, but uh, that's a big thing for me is sort of just go find clubs you might be interested in and put your email down and, and sort of see where it goes. And one thing for me, I would say that first week, like orientation week, I think is like one of the most fun weeks on campus. Like everyone is in the same position as you. Like even if you look at someone, you're like, oh my gosh, like how do they know so many people? They don't. No one has any idea what's going on. Like you need to go up and like meet as many people as possible. Just go up and introduce yourself to random people because everyone knows looking to make friends. Like everyone is feeling the same kind of gut way where it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know anyone. I don't know what's going on. Like this is nuts, right? But when you go into that first week, just you just have to go around and like kind of accept that and be like, try and meet as many people as possible because everyone's doing the same exact thing. Um, I think that's great advice from Billy and Jack. I would just go and I would say be present. Um, and th th those are two things that you can really control in the grand scheme of things. If you're present on campus, whether that's Zoom, um, whatever next fall looks like when you guys are hopefully here, whatever, whatever, whatever that campus environment looks like, be present and just try to like be here and really feel it and um, experience your freshman year. Um, and then be open to as, much, as many different things as you can, like Billy and Jack were saying. The best way to get the most out of your freshman year is to put yourself out there. You're not going to meet, you won't know people if you don't ever put yourself out there to meet the clubs, the involvement there, the involvement fair is right there for you to just um, sign up for whatever you think piques your interest. Um, and then lastly, I would just say be you. Um, just bring your most authentic self. Um, don't try to force yourself um, into a box that's never been you. Um, and then be, be, be accepting of change. Like it's, it's be you, but there is going to be parts of you that are here to explore and change different parts of yourself. So take that college experience and start, start it right from freshman year. <laughs> um, I was gonna say the same thing as everyone else. Um, great advice. Um, I, I I joined so many things when I was a freshman, and um, too many that I could. Even, I can't. I sometimes have to look at my resume to remember all the things that I'm a part of. Um, but um, Providence is such an awesome place. Um, and wherever you guys end up, um, it, it's all meant to be. Um, but enjoy senior year of high school because that's honestly such an awesome time too. Absolutely. Um, prospective students, we are at 5.05 now. So if you want to stick around, we do have more questions that we will keep talking through. Um, I'm going to touch upon those admission related ones really fast and then I'll push it back over to the students um, just so that if you do have other things you need to get to, dinner, whatever it is, homework, um, I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to hear these answers. Um, one student was asking about where you can submit your resume. There is a place on the Common Application where you can upload that, um, either in the additional info section or there usually is um, a place that you can add that. 
If not that, feel free to email it directly to your personal counselor in our office. If you go onto our um, admission page and click on contact, uh, you'll be able to find out who your personal counselor is in our office. Uh, for all of you who are here, I personally am the person for Grace's Place in Connecticut. Uh, so Grace was one of my students back in the day, but I have New Haven, Middlesex, Litchfield, and Waterbury counties of Connecticut, all of Nassau County on Long Island, and then half of the state of Florida. Um, so pretty much Orlando North. If any of you fall into that territory, I'm your person. Feel free to email your resume directly to me. But again, all of you have your own counselor as well. Um, I will let Jack touch upon this as well, but Ava, your question about the marketing program and brand marketing or fashion marketing. My best friend in college did go into fashion marketing after our four years in college. She was a history major and marketing minor actually. Um, so a little different, but I'll have Jack touch upon that. If you know anything about brand marketing or fashion marketing. Um, yeah, I don't know uh, a ton. I mean, brand marketing, uh, I don't know a ton about fashion marketing. I do know um, there is an elective here at Providence College that is fashion merchandising, fashion, fashion marketing. I can't remember which one. Um, so when you're, whatever your major is, there'll be additional courses that are elective. So you can choose like right now I'm in personal selling. Um, and then there's the fashion one that if you want to do that, you could, in terms of brand marketing, uh, the undergraduate experience gives you a ton of, um, exposure to all kinds of different stuff. So, um, to Joseph's point earlier about the group projects, I was taking, uh, consumer, a uh, buyer behavior where we did a, uh, semester long group project where we looked at different, um, trends in consumer attitudes and behaviors and did all kinds of focus groups. Um, freshman year we did, um, more of a brand marketing style social media campaign. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that I could go on about, but, um, the, the school does a good job of getting you, uh, exposure to all different kinds of marketing, uh, advertising, PR, all that stuff. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, it does sort of how I can speak to it. And I can follow up with more information about that as well after we wrap up today. Um, another question, two questions about um, applying to get into the School of Business. So prospective students on the common application, we do have our Providence Supplemental Member page. On there is where you would indicate your specific major moving forward. Um, and as Dean Elsek explained earlier, you do start in that program your freshman year with us. Yes, that development of Western Civ class plus business courses. Um, so you put that on your application. Uh, we do harp a little bit more on that math preparation coming in. The students, again, have this conversation with your counselor in our office. We are looking for a minimum of pre-calculus in high school, though. Um, if you've reached calculus senior year, that's amazing. Um, but that minimum of pre-calculus, if you are not in pre-calc this year, um, I do not encourage you to apply as a School of Business student yet. Um, you do have that opportunity to change your major after getting that preparation on our campus first. I hope that answers those two questions. Um, we do have a question about uh, kind of switching back to that student life experience. Um, and I have two in the group who I think are great to answer this, asking about sports. We'll come back to intramurals, but more so club or the division one programs on campus. I'm calling you both out. Um, so as a freshman at PC, um, actually started my own, my own, um, our own um, club softball team. Um, when I was looking at schools, I definitely wanted a school that had club softball, but unfortunately PC didn't. Um, but I love Providence so much that I didn't want to say no to PC for that reason. Um, so I went to the vice president of student affairs um, and after a lot of hard work, I got that started. Um, so there's a list online of all the club sports that we have here, but um, if they don't have one, um, that you're interested in, um, it's definitely possible for you to start it. Um, but now that I just started, I've met so many awesome friends through my team. Um, and I'm such, it's a big bummer that we can't play this semester, but um, it's one of my fondest memories from college. So, um, yeah. yeah. I can back that up. I'm a huge advocate for club sports. Like, it's a nice balance of where, for me, it gives me a routine every week. Like, I'm still practicing five days a week. I play curl rugby. And, um, like, but at the same time, it's not my entire life. Like, we travel in the Big East and, like, regionally. Like, the farthest school we travel is, like, four hours away. But we're still – still got a team mentality, that team vibe. So, like, for me, freshman year, I'm from Utah. I didn't really know anyone here. I didn't have any, like, upperclassmen friends to, like, kind of tell me what was going on. 
and so club rugby or whatever club or sport that you're thinking about joining definitely do it because for me it gave me those upperclassmen connections like oh i have a car i can drive you to cvs or like oh like you take this professor don't take this professor or oh like yeah this is the day i'll come to ray with you like just kind of the simple things or having some kind of some older people around you i think for me was super helpful freshman year Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, students, I think we've touched upon pretty much all of the other ones that have come through. Um, Fiona, you unfortunately cannot minor in marketing if you are one of our business programs. It's for students not in the School of Business. Um, and one thing that we haven't touched upon yet today is our new communications minor um, that will officially be underway next fall, but our current students can start to sign up for that as well. Um, but it really just pairs together our English creative writing and marketing programs together in a great way. Um, a lot of information on that is coming on the website. Um, but as we start to wrap up this afternoon, I know we've gone a little bit over on our time, um, but I think in a great way. Um, any final questions that our prospective students have as our current students give that final one piece of wisdom moving forward? You have all done an amazing job with what you've shared so far, but um, anything other than a good, good go Friars here to wrap up? Uh, well, good luck with the admissions process and what that it's a, what that's going to look like this fall and next spring. Um, enjoy your senior year of high school. Hopefully, your senior spring is a lot more open than this uh, senior fall is. And then, yeah, I go Friars. I can't forget that part. <laughs> Go Friars, and I hope to see you guys in the front row of the dunk. I'm very excited for basketball season soon. Just good luck with everything, guys, and Go Friars. Same thing, Go Friars. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, this recording will be posted to our website shortly. Um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to email those along to your counselor. But I thank you all for spending your Tuesday afternoon with us. As always, go Friars.